Bienvenue, benvenuti, and welcome to Expatriotical, the podcast for expats, travelers, and other adventurous souls. I'm Chandra Ali, and after living as an expat with my husband and four children in two different countries for six years, I've learned the arts of pivoting during pitfalls, traveling tastefully for less, and soaking in amazing new cultures without losing your own. Join me as we dive into the joys and challenges of travel and the expat life in every episode. Hello, everybody. I'm sure glad that you're joining me today, especially if you are a parent. I've been wanting to do this episode for a while, but because my experience with solo parenting happens more sporadically, and I have dear friends that do it on a lot more of a regular basis, I thought that I might need to team up with somebody that's had more experience with this than I have. So today, we will be welcoming my friend Kim Ross, a veteran expat and mom of twins who regularly conquers the feat of solo parenting while living abroad. This interview interview was insightful and there's lots of takeaways for everyone listening. And honestly, even if you're not a parent, I'm really big on having compassion for other people's situations and hearing Kim's stories will help you to maybe have some insight to when you see that mom that seems to be a little bit more frazzled than normal or that dad who might have snapped a little bit at his kids at school pickup. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes and this interview sheds a little bit of light into that situation. Listen in. Today, I have my friend, and I used to be able to say neighbor, Kim Ross with me here today to talk about a topic that many CIPs, completely irreplaceable partners or expat spouses have to deal with, and that is solo parenting. So I want to say welcome, Kim, and thank thank you. you for being on Expatriotical. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm a bit nervous, but... Oh gosh, don't be nervous. Don't be nervous at all. So to start with, can you please tell me a little bit about yourself and where you are from originally and also then after that kind of your family dynamic as it currently stands? Yeah, so my name is Kim Ross. I am from Texas, although my parents are Vietnamese. I am married. I've been married for 12 years. My husband works for an oil field services company We have twins, a boy and a girl. They're eight years old, and they go to the same school as yours do, which is how we met. Exactly. All right. So since the beginning of, let's call it your family conception, just you you and your husband, um, were you guys were already an international or dual country couple, correct? Can I say that correct? Right. I forgot to mention my husband is British, so he's actually been an expat since almost from when he started the company. Wow. So he'll be 25 years with the company in January, and he probably worked the first two years in Scotland. He's part Scottish. But after that, he was always on the move. So he's never lived at home. And so would you say that even before, I don't know if he changed positions in the company and that's what caused him to do the moving, but would you say with that in mind, knowing like you're marrying a British citizen, was it always kind of in your the back of your mind that you might be an expat? Yeah, it's funny that you asked that because we had that <laughs> conversation when we first met and I was 23 when we first met. So I'd always lived in the States, had never moved. But I did come from a family that was an expat, uh, not an expat family, but my dad moved around a lot. Okay. And he was never home. So my mom was always solo parenting. Okay. Because their choice was that the family was going to stay in Texas and my dad was the one that moved. Okay. So he would live abroad for years at a time. Really? And just come home to see us. Oh my goodness. So you kind of have like secondhand experience and yeah. now firsthand experience. Yeah. But I never thought my life was going to be like that. Like that. I yeah. thought I was going to stay in Texas and that was going to be it. But then I met my husband and I remember asking him, we weren't dating yet. And I said, so what happens if you meet someone here? Yeah. Are you, you expect them to pick up and leave their life behind? And he just said, yes. Okay. He said, if they love me enough, oh my goodness. they'll come. Okay. And I just went, okay. Interesting. Well, and I in love- my head, I was kind of going, good luck. You know? <laughs> exactly. Good luck with that. But I love that he was honest right from the get go. Like just in general, even you weren't even dating, but he was just like, yeah, that's, I mean, like this yeah. is my life and this is what I, what I'm thinking, you know, so that's good. It's no surprises then. Yeah. So there were no surprises from the beginning. That's really good. So, um, After, when was the first time that once you all were married, 
that you moved from the United States and where did you go? So we actually moved before we got married. Oh gosh. Okay. Which is not a popular thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think even my friends went, are you crazy? Because what happens if you, if it doesn't work out? Exactly. Exactly. So we got engaged though before we left. Okay. So it was um, 2012. Okay. We moved to London. All right. But we didn't have kids obviously. And then we ended up getting married in the UK. And then we actually didn't have kids until we came back from the UK, which was in 2015. So we were there for almost three years, then came back to Texas. Okay. Not by choice. It just happened that way. Came back to Texas, and then now we're in Paris since November 2020. Okay. So, wow, November 2020. I know I knew that, but, like, it was just, you know, it, it was still past. a wild time. <laughs> wow. Okay, so you didn't have t- kids at the time. They came along when you moved back to Texas. And then at that point, when the, t- when the twins were born, did your husband start having to travel shortly after that? Did you have, like, a little bit of space of time before he had to start going on business trips? He's always been traveling. I don't think it stopped because we had kids. Goodness gracious. And you know, in the States, the the dads only get one week of paternity leave. Yeah. So he was there helping me for one week and then that was it. He was off. And even when he is working, it still feels like I'm solo parenting because he leaves before the kids wake up. Yeah. And then he's home after they've gone to bed. Yes. Which is when my parenting stops. Right. It's <laughs> after they've gone to my, I mean, the parenting, the difficult part of it is finished when they're in, in bed because exactly. I have my free time. But if he's not home to help me do the bedtime routine, I'm, I am solo parenting. No, absolutely. So, I want to say free time in air quotes because like really free time. I mean, yeah, fine. I'm be, doing the dishes, yeah. but in peace. In peace. So, That's, true. <laughs> That's so true. That's so true. So, I mean, when he, when he went, you, in America still had your family a li- for a little bit of support, correct? Yes. My mom ended up moving in with us to okay, help yeah. us with the twins yeah, for five months. Twins. Oh my goodness. Um, yeah. Otherwise I would have had to hire, I guess, a, a, a night nurse or is that something what they call them or something, something. like that. Exactly. Um, but I don't remember exactly what his travel was like back then because I feel like he's always traveled a lot. Okay. It's not something I even keep up with anymore. So would you say that like after, after your mom moved out and you're like, okay, I think I got this. And, um, and he was traveling. Cause like you said, that's just been a constant. What were some of the mechanisms, if you can remember any that you set up to make parenting two young children, two babies, a little more, a little more easier when you're, when you were on your own, like if you couldn't call mom, she's busy or yeah. what, what have you. I think the most important thing for me was a routine. Oh, I'm very good. type A. Nice. So I needed to know that we were going to wake up at this time. They had bottles at this time. And then we, I had them busy with activities. Okay. So they had music. Okay. With, which a, with a company called uh, Prelude. It's called Music Together here. I okay. think it's the same program. And then I had them in Gymboree, okay. which was a very baby version of gymnastics. Okay. And I had them in swimming. So there were various things and it's swimming for babies. It's not of course swimming. Yeah. <laughs> um, so to have an activity all the time. And then I had friends that would come bring me food for lunch and Aww. at least give me some adult conversation, yeah. which was really important. And then I did have my mom come once a week yeah, just to, sure. you know, let me go to the gym or go out with my friends for a drink after yeah. they got off work and then she would stay the night. Oh, so, so as great. long as I had, and that was always on Thursdays. So I did have a very strict routine. I like that though, because I think number one, I, I do tend to like routines. Like I set my, some, I mean, not everything is routine. I do like some spontaneity, but in general, setting up some routine when you are in life with kids, it can really build, um, I don't want to say a safety net, but kind of like, it's okay because I know at this time this is going to happen, you know? God forbid catastrophes interrupt your day, but it just kind of, I think can give a mental breather that you can look forward to if that makes any sense. Yeah. And one thing that does help when my husband's not, my husband is away is that I don't have to feed him. So okay. that actually helps re- alleviate the cooking side of things. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when they're little, when they don't really eat much more than baby food or yes. things like that. Yeah. I don't have to worry about making him a meal and I can just grab something quick because yeah. I just need something that will, fill me up. I don't need to make a three course meal. Exactly. exactly. Whereas 
he can my husband can be a little bit more he's a foodie let's be he honest is, he's a foodie and his meals are important to him yeah. so he doesn't like to do things on the go yeah so he likes to sit down and eat a proper and enjoy. meal which is fine as long yeah. as I know when he's home and not home so exactly. I can plan there you go. And so there you go. All of the spouses that are the trap, like, please share your schedule. This is super important. That's so important. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. So now fast forward from the beginning, eight years since the twins were born. And what are some things that you have in place, if they've changed, that make those days or sometimes weeks when your husband is gone more doable as a solo parent? I'm going to guess still routine. Yeah, still routine. Things are a little bit easier now because the kids are older. Yeah. So they go to school. Yes. But now I have my day planned out from the minute I drop them off at the bus. I basically go to the store, which is just around the corner. Yeah. And grab stuff for dinner or for lunch the next day. And then I usually have laundry going. Okay. There's always something to hang, fold, wash. It seems nonstop. Yeah. So laundry is something that is just always, I'm always behind on, it seems like. Um, and then just cleaning stuff there's living in Europe I find that there's a lot of dust everywhere yeah because you don't have that central air yes exactly it doesn't move it around it yeah just it's been so interesting so dust is my enemy so yeah it's those basic things but also I can now again I'm freed up because I don't have to make an extra meal yeah I can make the kids something more simple yeah and I have time to catch up on a book when they go to bed nice. or watch a show that my husband hates <laughs> There are those shows that him and I do not watch together because yeah. he just He's won't like, do it. I can't do this. Yeah. yeah. So those are saved. I have a list That's awesome. of the things I can knock out when he's not around. I like that because I think, again, it's something now to look forward to of like, yeah. oh yeah, I was really, can't wait to start this when that time comes that I have the TV to myself. Yeah. But he has made it a point where we have to speak on the phone every day. Good. We kind of got away from that just because we got so busy and we would just text. Okay. But he was the one that said, I don't like that. We Aww. need to speak on the phone, even if it's just for five minutes. Aww. So he made more of a conscious effort. I would text him because it's usually him with the busy schedule. So I would text exactly. if we were free and then he could call us. He wants to speak to the kids if they're still awake. So yeah, it's been a lot on him to be a little bit more mindful yeah. of that. And try to be more in touch with the kids because I think that's the bit that he misses. Yes, exactly. You know, he wants to speak to them as well. Um, when he's working, it also motivates him to come home earlier because I don't push the kids' bedtime just to keep at all. Up. Exactly. Yeah. You know, that or has to, to be on up. him to be responsible for that. Yeah. If you want to see the kids, you know what time they go to bed. Exactly. So just try to leave the office earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You know, they go to bed at eight thirty, so mm -hmm. that he needs to be home by then. But if he walks in the door at nine, too late. He misses them, exactly. you know, exactly, which makes them sad as well. Of course, and I, but I do like that. That was something that I mean, he got to or came up with on his own on his own part when he's traveling because Chris has not traveled as much since we've been in in Paris the last two years. I don't know if anybody can hear the. <laughs> The cleaning noise of the apartment above us. But if that's if you hear a weird squeaking noise, that's what that is. Um, so he hasn't traveled as much here in in Paris but or in France. But when we were in Italy, um, he would travel qu quite a little bit, I would say. And then even when we were in America, um, especially even before he got to this position, he had a position before with his employer where he traveled a lot. At that time, we only had one child. But... Um, and bless her heart, I love her so much. But she was a really difficult baby. And so I was like, you know, couldn't wait for him to, to come home. So I think, though, as they've gotten older, I would kind of get out of this habit of like, you know, wait, calculating what time zone is he in? And, you know, all. and you're right, they have this busier schedule. We Our things are going to be the same. And so maybe that is kind of a thing where couples can sit down and talk and like, let's try to make this communication to where you're talking. Because I'll be honest that sometimes it's, it'll be, if he's got like a week long trip in America, then I'm, I'm like, he might talk to the kids like once or twice because mm -hmm. I don't, he's usually in the Pacific time zone and just, you know, all those sort of things where I'm just like, okay, well, you yeah. know, you're in the middle of your work week or your work day when I'm putting these guys to bed and we've been busy and homework and all this stuff. But I love that even just carving out that slice of time, the mm -hmm. five minutes to like for you to talk, for him to talk to the kids. That's really wise. And, and I think very, um, uplifting for the family 
to sit. Yeah, keep for that sure. Unit. It makes a huge difference. Yeah, for sure. So I would, um, I would ask, what would you say has been one of your biggest challenges that you have faced, whether it was like a one-time occurrence or, um, uh, or like a regular thing when you are solo, par- solo parenting as an expat. And I'm asking this because I think it's important for people like listening to know that some of the difficulties that they may be facing are shared by many other, especially when they're new expats, because you might think like, oh, why am I having a hard time with this thing or with this thing? And for example, something that I struggled with that I found surprising in Italy was I would get in this rhythm of like powering through, you know, while he's gone. And then he would come home and disrupt the rhythm. Like his present, like not that he was trying, sorry, sorry, babe, if you're listening. Um, Not that he was trying, but just like, it just it just kind of throws this like machine that I had working out of whack. And it's just a new, a new thing we have to get, you have to readjust again and get used to him being home again. That was something that caught what that was, that caught me off guard. I was surprised when that was, when that would happen the first couple of times. I'm like, gosh, like it's been really hard and I expected it to be easier when he gets home and it kind of is, but then this kind this one thing kind of makes it, um, more difficult if that makes any sense yeah that's true they almost become the fun parent yes okay yeah yes thank you (laughs) it is it's just like I'm still like like follow the regimen and they're like hey guys you know yeah no that is a difficult thing um I think it's the kids and how disappointed they are and how they almost now expect him to not be around which I think makes him really sad oh For example, you know, these things they do at school for Mother's Day and Father's Day where they fill in a questionnaire and talk about you. Yeah. His basically said something like they asked a question and Harry wrote, oh, I wouldn't know because my dad's never home or something. You know, he he almost said he couldn't answer the question because he He doesn't know. And Simon saw it, obviously, and it just is heartbreaking for him, which I think motivates him, though, to be home earlier from work yeah because that's a part of it it's not just the travel yes it's the fact that they don't even see him when he's in town yeah exactly they only see him on the weekends Weekends. yeah um another part of it is that I seem to become his admin at home okay Okay. so I have to book his doctor's appointments yeah but then I also have to cancel them or change them (laughs) okay you know I'm dealing with the tax guys Mm -hmm. which is which is Not something that's that difficult because they just need forms filled in and things like that because our company luckily does our taxes for us through through another company. But, you know, so now I'm having to stay on top of not just our normal school routines and everything, but I'm having to contact him while he's abroad to deal with, you know, something's happening to his tooth and all of a sudden I need to book a dentist appointment for when he gets back. Yeah, Yeah. But the problem is I don't know his schedule. So now he has to carve out time to send me dates that he's available, but he doesn't have time. To send you those dates. Yeah. So now I'm bugging him. He's annoyed because I'm bugging him, but I'm only bugging him because he told me to. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yes. So it's this vicious cycle, I think. Yeah. It's funny because I wish, and I know that for companies' privacy things, they probably can't do this, but sometimes I wish I could just have his schedule on my phone. So I could be like, okay, cool. Cause otherwise, yeah, the same thing with, he does his own dental appointments and stuff like that. And actually since we've been in France, Chris has done pretty much everything. He would probably say he did everything for himself. Like uh, he would say that probably in um, Italy too, but I would have to disagree (laughs) there. But like he does, you know, everything himself now, but it, but for example, the car, that's the thing for us. Like he has the car all the time, but the car needs maintenance. So when would be a good day for you not to go to work and work from home? You know, like that kind of thing is just like, or you could make the appointment. I don't have time right now. You know, that kind of thing. It's yeah. It's this vicious, not vicious, but just annoying cycle that kind of, yeah. that can kind of, cause happen. I love keeping him organized. It's just yeah. that I don't have the information to do so. Yeah, exactly. And uh, then he gets annoyed if, well, so did you book my appointment? Well, I was waiting on dates from you, which he's already forgotten. I asked him for. Yes, exactly. So then it becomes this thing where he's getting annoyed and I'm getting annoyed. And yeah. Yeah. So I think communication has to be so clear. Yes. You know, with who does what, what's expected of who, and you have to be okay with the agreement Both so sides. that you don't exactly. harbor any resentment. Oh, that's good. You know? Yeah. Because let's say we had no conversations and the minute he gets home 
he's supposed to all of a sudden do the nighttime routine if he gets home early. Like, what? That's the last thing he wants to do. Yeah, exactly. He's been working nonstop in meetings nonstop. The last thing he wants to do is put the kids to bed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He'll, he'll say goodnight to them and stuff, but it's a lot trying to wrangle them into their pajamas mm-hmm. and get them to brush their teeth and floss and go to the toilet. It's... Yeah. It's a whole thing. Yeah. Exactly. So I don't expect him to help me with any of that. If he's going to do it, he does it of his own accord and lets me know. Okay. And then I'll see that they're doing it. They're brushing their teeth and I'm pleasantly surprised. Great. You know, so it's better to manage your expectations mm. so that you can be pleasantly surprised rather than constantly disappointed. And see, I think that's all you're very wise to say that. I would say that I always had these like, really high expectations of like okay so now it's my break time even though he has he has been working and traveling and maybe he just jumped you know nine time zones and had to fly you know all the things and I'm just like but I'm tired you know and so I like that open communication good communication sometimes I think it's really important for some of that to be written communication so Mm. and I'm not trying to sound vindictive but just so you can go back and say like hey but remember I sent you this email (laughs) do you remember that like I know it might have fallen through the cracks or a text message or something like that because even I I would say especially I actually forget sometimes something he's told me you know what I'm saying like like, oh yeah yeah. or even and sometimes even in an email like you know I looped you into that email feed I'm like yeah 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 but you know so I think continual open communication in multi multiple forms probably is yeah, you're right. So. Sign the contract in blood. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You can't back out. Um, okay. What has been a good surprise, if there are any, of having to solo parent at times? Well, I keep saying this because I don't like cooking, but it's the fact that I don't have to make him a meal or even I have to iron less shirts. Right? Hey. Because as long as if he's not wearing them, then I don't have to continuously, exactly. you know, Because sometimes when he's traveling, he doesn't have to dress up as much. He'll be out in the field or something just wearing polos. But it's the ironing of shirts just nonstop and the having to make, you know, a proper meal every night. That can take a lot out of someone. No, it really can. So it's nice to kind of get that break. That's good. And it it sounds bad, maybe. I'm not saying that I want him to be away, but that is something when he tells me he's going to be away. First, it's a little bit of disappointment, but then I think, okay, I'll make easier meals that week yeah, and not have to iron so many shirts. No, totally. It's a win. Totally true. That's funny because it, it, like you said, it's not that you're looking forward to them being gone. For me, it's like I have one less lunch to make. And then we can have pancakes for dinner and pancakes and eggs. He doesn't like pancakes. So that's an easy and the kids are thrilled. So yeah, these little wins that you have during that time, I think that's really important to acknowledge them and, and then also to look forward to them because you, you do have something that, I mean, when they're gone, there's their, I don't want to say drawbacks, but like it just changes. And so there's nice things like that to look forward to. Less yeah. cooking. I'm, I'm totally down with less cooking. Um, okay, so the next questions are just going to be three standard questions that I ask everybody when they come on the podcast, which you have heard because you are a very faithful listener. Thank yes, you. Yes, I am. And so what is your favorite thing about being an expat? Oh, gosh. I think it's just getting to meet so many different people. Okay, yeah. And experience the culture of the different cities that we lived in. I I haven't lived in that many. I've just done London and Paris, but both very wildly different yeah. from the States. Yes. And I'm not someone who actually likes change very much. So this is coming from someone who's evolved a lot. You know, when I first found out we were moving, I mean, it was terrifying. I didn't mm. want to do it, but I had to just have an open mind and I've met so many nice people along the way. Some I'm still very close to. So yeah, I mean, it's, it changes your life for the better. Oh, for sure. That's awesome. That's really, it wasn't what I expected you to say. And I really <laughs> like that. Thank you. Um, okay. Another question. What is one of your favorite memories that you can share? That's not too personal that you've had during your expat adventure, whether here in Paris or in London. Oh, wow. Favorite memory. Yeah, I know. It's, there's, there's so, so many, many to choose from, I'm sure. I'm I mean, sure. They, there's good and bad, yeah, yeah, yeah. obviously. Um, so I think living in London, it's not one memory in particular, but it was okay. being able to see his mom and his sister more. Aww. And he's so close to them. 
So just That's awesome. being able to see them together, um, which they don't get to do very much, That's was really, really nice and fun. And then we got to spend time with his aunties and uncles, who he doesn't see very often either. Um, so getting to spend Christmas with them and holidays and getting to be in his home town or his home country. Yeah. You know, doing things that we don't do in America. Yeah. They have Christmas crackers that they do a Christmas lunch. And, okay. You know, that's where you pull the, it's got a little firework inside. And oh, you, you interesting. You change hands and you pull them and they snap. And oh, then fun. there's a joke inside and a hat and a little toy. So, you know, little things like that that we still do now because I just love them so much. Oh, I love and it. And so we've carried them on. Um, that was in the UK. Here in Paris, it's been getting to see the kids learn another language. That's oh. been really cool. Okay. Because that's not something I can do. I'm not a language person, so I only speak one language. But okay. being able to see them speak another language has cool. been really fun. I love it. That's that's really cool that you actually get to see that because my kids a lot don't like don't want to speak in front of me. So that's impressive that you get to hear those little bits. Yeah, they, mine don't want to either. But you see, it slips out sometimes. Mm when they're around French people and okay. maybe I don't understand something and then Penny will be able to say something. Oh, I love that. And I'll say, oh, you actually understood that. So That's something okay. is working, even though you're telling me that you don't understand. Anything. Yeah. You're not learning anything, <laughs> but clearly they're learning. Clearly something. they're learning. Oh, so. that's good. I love those are, those are really great. Um, like you said, cumulative maybe memories, but yeah, it's yeah. really great. Okay. And finally, and this one kind of puts people on the spot, but it doesn't have to be profound. Is there anything else, any last thoughts, words of wisdom or words of encouragement that you'd like to share today, especially for like somebody out there that, um, it doesn't have to be just for a solo parent, but somebody out there that's like finding themselves being a solo parent abroad and for the first time. Yeah, I think it's going back to the whole managing expectations. Okay. So you have to hope for the best okay. and plan for the worst. Okay. You know, okay. and I think if you do those things, you're going to cover it all and not set yourself up for disappointment all the time. That's good. Yeah, I like that. I think that's the biggest thing is, is you expect too much of people or things around you or your experience and even if it's just slightly below what you expected, then you're, you feel like you failed or, mm, you know, and yeah. it's too much. Yeah. You just have to relax and kind of go with the flow, I kinda think, as an expat. Flow. Which, I, like you said, coming from you, I love hearing that because like, <laughs> I'm not. Cause it, cause, but, but you do though, you do go with the flow. It's just not something that you love to do. No. But you do it. So, yeah. So yeah. I set my bar very low. Okay. Because I'm so type A, I need to know what's happening. I need to have a plan. But living abroad, you just cannot you can't plan for live everything. like that. Yeah. No. Yeah, exactly. Oh, this is great. This is wonderful. And I think like over something that can be kind of heavy. I mean, honestly, it can be kind of heavy at yeah. times. The thought or overwhelming or the thought of like, okay, my, my, my spouse is going to be gone for a week or two weeks this time. And that, and that can be a lot. But just like you said, set the bar low just pre prepare and plan as much plan for the hope for the best plan for the worst and and the routine part and managing yeah and, oh and one more thing you know for the single parents out there this Ooh. is by no means you know we're not comparing oh gosh, solo no, parenting you. to single parent which no. they sound very similar no they're not the same but like, not you the do same not way. have that person to that comes home and, right and you have the sole financial yeah, responsibility exactly. and everything it's Thank you. Thank yeah. you for saying that. Yes, it's not the same thing at all. I think that it's just really nice for those that are that are have dual parents in in that home, but one of them is gone whether frequently or even if it's infrequently, just for those parents to hear you're not alone. This is, you know, maybe talk to your single parent friend and 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 ask like it's funny because I've literally thought to ask my aunt who raised my cousin, you know, who's my age now by on her own, like, what are some things you did? Like, because sometimes, I mean, she did it all. She was the mom and the dad, you know? And so like, it's just nice to have some of that wisdom of like, how, what, what helped you get through? What made you feel successful, et cetera. So anyways, yeah, thank you for, for saying sure. that. That's important. You're welcome. <laughs> awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Kim. The practical advice that Kim gives of hoping for the best, 
planning for the worst and setting the bar low with your expectations, not to expect nothing at all, but so that you don't feel like a failure later is something that every parent, regardless of if you are solo parenting or not, should really consider. But especially when you are solo parenting, you are only one person. You can only be in one place at one time. And you only have so much energy and internal resources to give. Now, I am preaching to the choir, like literally preaching to myself about this because I tend to set really high expectations and then I burn out. But I am slowly but surely, 11 years into this parenting journey, learning to lower my expectations of myself a little bit, of my children as much as I can tolerate, and just in general. But I will admit, it is painstakingly hard for me to do. If you are out there and you hear this and you are currently solo parenting, just came off of an extended period of solo parenting or are preparing for a time of solo parenting, hear this. You can do it. It doesn't have to be perfect. If your kids come out on the other side of it, well-fed, reasonably groomed and knowing they're loved, you have done well. And if you regularly do this or have just finished a stint of solo parenting, I'm proud of you. That's something I think we as adults don't hear enough, but we really should because it can still mean a lot. I'm proud of you. You should be proud of yourself and maybe share that positivity towards others. If you're the mom or dad or sister or brother of someone who is raising their children either entirely on their own, because that's a big bravo right there, or occasionally on their own. Tell them you're proud of them. I think you're never too old to hear it. And now for our Shan Select of the week. As the weather has gotten quite chilly and it's only September when I'm recording this, I have been ready to break out one of my favorite French foods and that is raclette. Raclette is great because if you're gluten-free, you can eat it. If you're a vegetarian, you can eat it. And if you're none of those things, you can absolutely eat it. Now, raclette itself is not my Shan Select, though I do plan to talk more about it in the future, but Le Chalet de Neuilly is where I first tasted it and fell in love. The ambiance at Le Chalet has a cozy winter vibe with decorations of skis, photos of snow-covered mountains, and even an old gondola inside. You feel as though you are transported to the French Alps, even though you're only a couple of minutes walk from the border of Paris proper. Raclette is served in the traditional way at Le Chalet de Neuilly, a wedge of cheese is skewered onto a machine that when turned on starts to melt it. You're given boiled potatoes, pickles, mustard, and if you like, salami and cold cut meats to accompany. As the cheese bubbles and melts, you scrape it onto your potato and add whatever accompaniments you'd like. It's warm and filling and paired with a cold glass of Riesling, it's the perfect meal for those chilly winter and apparently early autumn days. The environment at Le Chalet is family friendly and welcoming, but also great for a business lunch where you just want to do something a little different. I'll be sure to include the website in the show notes so you can check it out for yourself. And as usual, I'm not an affiliate, just a fan. Before I sign off today, everyone, I have a big favor to ask right now. Would you please take a moment to think about somebody in your life that this episode might be useful for? And then pause this episode and take 30 seconds to just tap on that share button and send it to that person. Okay, are you back? Thank you for doing that. Word of mouth is a great way to grow the expatriatical community. And it's so nice to hear from somebody directly that this podcast has been beneficial to you. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this and to think of that person in your life that could be helped by this episode or one that you've already heard. All of it is so helpful and all of it matters. That's it for today, everyone. Wishing you a fantastic rest of your week, regardless of which day you're listening on. I'll meet you back here again next week. And until then, this is Chandra Alley reminding you to live and travel in the know with Expatriatical. <laughs>